Welcome to the roundtable discussion that is scheduled by the Center for New Economic Studies under the Environment and Social Issues Cluster. For this uh, discussion, we'll try to look at the story that was reported by CNN on June 5th, which reveals the UN chief who says the world is on way uh, on highway to climate hell as planned in just 12 straight months of unprecedented heat. Now, uh, um, as we kind of observe and try to unpack a lot of stories varying different geographical entities, we try to observe the uh, alarming increase in global climate crisis, especially the global temperature to a great extent. So to begin the conversation itself, we try to delve, we like to try, uh, delve deep into this particular story and see what are the certain statistics that has been shared by the United Nations and the councils and what are certain future predictions that the statistics indicates? And how has this particular prompted to the ban of certain advertising uh, advertising markets which links with the burning of fossil fuels? Because it is kind of um, significant out there, as, uh, especially as the story reveals. So for this discussion, I'd like to ask Prabhup to share her thoughts. And from there, we can take it further. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. So over here, I think we have to start by asking a very simple question. How are extreme heat waves linked to burning fossil fuels? So it's really simple. Burning fossil fuels raises greenhouse gases that trap more heat in the atmosphere, leading to overall higher temperatures. And as higher as av the average temperature rises, we are getting to experience more frequent, intense and long lasting heat waves that are not only uncomfortable, but also impact human health, animal health, while having implications on food and water secu uh, security. So in response to this climate crisis that exacerbates such events, a few European nations became the first to ban fossil fuel advertisements. So the UN Secretary General urged global leaders to prohibit advertising of fossil fuels, and Amsterdam was the first uh, city to implement this. And then in 2021, and then later France also uh, implemented the same. Edinburgh recently became the latest UK city to prohibit ads for fossil fuels, airlines, cruise ships, and high carbon vehicles on city owned sites like bus, bus stops and billboards. So now there are two sides to this discussion. Um, there was this one study that was conducted uh, in transport for London's ban, for, ban on junk food ads which prevented around 90, 95,000 cases of obesity, saving uh, a lot of money for the National Health Service between the years 2019 to 20, uh, 2022. So this indicates that ads do impact consumer perception and behavior in a few ways, such as reducing the exposures to fossil fuel marketing, de decreased demand for fossil fuel products, increased awareness of climate impacts, align, align and alignment with policy goals. Um, for instance, the city of Edinburgh Council stated that the ban aims to promote low carbon behaviors and shift societal perceptions, recognizing the advertising industry's role in shaping public opinion. However, there's also another side to this discussion. Uh, in the United States, authorities stated that implementing a nationwide ban on fossil fuel advertising would be really challenging. While advertising restrictions do exist uh, in the in the states so products like cigarettes and alcohol to protect children, these measures were most straightforward due to their clear health risks. However, uh, they said they said that this, a similar ban on fossil fuel ads would would face significant legal hurdles, since U.S. laws require that advertis advertising restrictions must prove that the campaign is false, misleading or illegal, and there would need a major legal shift to put this through. So uh, in conclusion, I'd like to say that while the goal of reducing fossil fuel consumption is critical, achieving it through advertising bans does involve a few challenges in different um, uh, different locations. And as we continue to tackle the climate crisis, it is crucial to explore more diverse strategies that persist in our efforts to reduce fossil fuel consumptions. So yeah, that would be my take on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for the scientific narrative. 
the consumer perspective. In which you have rightly mentioned how the public uh, opinions can be shaped through different advertisements. And it was also quite interesting that you mentioned about the two sides of the conversation in itself, as well as the legal hurdles. And I strongly believe that this also uh, shapes the legalities of the story that we kind of develop in this discussion as uh, we move forward the rest of it. However, when we are kind of uh, reading this particular report that CNN has prepared, we also come across the historical perspective and um, the mentioning of the pre-industrial era and how the temperature rise has been compared in that aspect as well. And how the, in, uh, the epoch of Anthropocene also is pretty much significant and the nature of temperature varies across different geographical areas. So, to share your thoughts about that, Puri, would you like to discuss some of the points that you have in hand so that this can be elaborated? Thank you, Sharon. Um, so, this is a very interesting topic to look at. Um, it, we can clearly see that there has been a huge impact on of um, human activity and um, man-made things. So um, I just want to begin by saying that the pre-industrial era was um, roughly spans from, you know, the beginning of human civilization to um, until about like 1850. And this had relatively stable global temperatures with minor fluctuations due to, you know, climate, due to the nature. And it was all very well balanced and um, it was nothing out of nothing that would sort of create like a crisis situation. It also had the little ice age, which was uh, basically like a period um, a spanning about 500 years. And, you know, it was a period of cooler global temperatures, particularly in the no northern hemisphere. But if you look at um, the current period, uh, if you fast forward to 2024, we're experiencing a significant increase in global temperatures. And um, with the average global temperature having risen above 1.5, 1 1.1 uh, Celsius. So um, since this is since the 19th century, late 19th century itself. So the primary driver of this warning, warming, sorry, is uh, human activity. As I said, the, so the impact of human activity, specifically, like the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, industrial processes like um, you know chemicals, whether it be toxic fumes from chimneys or um, disposal into rivers, they have increased a lot, and it has also increased the um, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. So the human impact on the environment has of course become increasingly pronounced over time. And in the pre-industrial era, human activities were relatively localized and limited to defore deforestation, that too on a very small scale. And you know, for agriculture or very um, predisposed forms of mining. And um, this wasn't really, as I mentioned, a crisis situation. This wasn't really harmful to the environment, nothing that nature couldn't balance on its own. But with industrialization and urbanization, we see that human activities became more widespread and they led to habitats, uh, to destruction, biodiversity loss, air and water pollution, and a very significant carbon footprint. So, you know, the geographical distribution of temperature is also very um, interesting to look at. The polar regions such as the Arctic have um, warmed at a rate that is much more, that is almost twice as the global average. This is a, a phenomenon known as the Arctic amplification. The temperate regions have experienced noticeable warming as well, affecting agriculture, water resources, ecosystems, um, and tropical um, regions have also warmed, but to a lesser extent, with a more intense heat waves or an altered rainfall patterns becoming more frequent. So we're seeing a lot of fluctuation there. We're seeing that that's one area that we're still seeing the impact of, like that hasn't been uh, set completely and we are still sort of witnessing um you know human activity impacting in a way so it just to put this into perspective i want to point out that 
the the twenty warmest years on record have all occurred since nineteen eighty one. The current decade is likely to be warmest on record. As we see, there have been numerous news. Um, you know, even in our day to day lives, um, we see that every year, you know, each summer it just gets warmer and warmer, and it becomes less and less tolerable. And well, you know, the 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 things, the solutions that we're coming up with are not keeping up pace. Also, the Arctic has warmed by. Uh, by about three degrees since the 1990s. So, you know, this is very interesting to see the impact of, in, instead of, say, the pre-industrial era or whatever, the current era, I would just say that the he, impact of human activity and the carbon footprint and the massive scale this is taking place on is very alarming. So, um, you know, the warming trend has also had devastating consequences around the world. Heat waves are becoming more frequent. The people are losing their life to heat waves. The, especially, you know, if you bring in the, um, uh, I know this is, I'm digressing from the topic, but um, these laborers that have nowhere else to go, they work in such heat, you know, I mean, hospitals are not equipped. I mean, in the sense, they can only, uh, provide short-term solutions, right? They can't fix, no one can fix the um, the heat waves except for us itself. So it's essential to address that these challenges have to be um, faced through con concentrated global efforts and we have to reduce greenhouse um, gas emissions. That's my take. Thank you. Thank you, Puri. And having that said, I kind of recollect reading some of the articles which were published from 2020 till 2023, especially between the months of December to January, based on the uh, um, nexus of the global increase as well. And um, as you rightly mentioned, it's not entirely different from the topic itself. The nature of occupation of people, especially the ones who are highly uh, dependent on agriculture, it might also change. And it might also shape the dynamics or the functioning of a society in itself. So when we are discussing, especially about the Anthropocene in itself today, what sort of society changes are observed should also be taken into consideration. So I would like to ask Ruchika to share her thoughts about the emerging trends of societal changes and the dynamics based on the article that was released in CNN. Yeah, so um, as far as the societal change is concerned, um, as we've seen, the rising temperature over different geographical areas uh, in, in these previous months, uh, it, the temperature have been rooted to an extent that you cannot make sense of, of, the, of the sudden and drastic change in the weather, uh, which has led to uh, even, even dozens of deaths. Uh, as even the article mentioned, because of the rise in the temperature and how people have uh, been affected in different economical sectors, um, starting with agriculture, have been uh, have been highly reduced, and which has led to uh, very shriveled crops, and there have been not just the death of human beings but also animals that are uh, that cannot cope with the temperature making it difficult to find basic necessities for humans and for uh, animal survival too. So uh, basic necessities like water, food are lacking in uh, uh, when people are looking for uh, uh, in, uh, among this weather. Um, some of the factors that do lead to uh, the societal change that we see is that one people this this increases the climate induced displacement uh, with people moving because of extreme weathers 
the uh, high in the uh, sea rise and even droughts. The second is that agriculture is becoming difficult to adapt with 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 such uh, with with certain degree of temperatures, which leads to which leads to using more pesticides and chemicals into the agriculture to produce more in the market, uh, which again uh, risks the health care. Uh, the urban planning has been uh, the, the urban planning even in the cities, the slums, the people living in slums are struggling to 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 have even basic necessity of water. Even Delhi has been uh, seen uh, in in place where people are struggling to find basic necessities. Uh, renewable energy is not being uh, is not being used fully to cope with the temperature. Uh, projects like to uh, projects to uh, calm uh, the effects of coal and other energy have also been have also not been successful like like uh, like they have promised in the paris agreement and maintaining uh, of course the average temperature have been difficult and it's not under control with the policies intact uh, in the international conferences uh, uh, so people uh, even the technology and the practices that we see are are making uh, are, are still it's a challenge to cope with the temperature and find finding some adaptive solutions to tackle and create awareness about how we can sort of mitigate the challenges in this real life situation that Anthropocene has reached and at sea. Thank you so much, Ruchika. And you have also rightly highlighted the different factors that can be counted, including the climate induced migration, the displacement of climate refugees, of climate migrants that we call today, the agricultural aspects, as well as the development of city planning and how the peripheries of cities are also highly affected unevenly. And that is where we also try to unpack the relevance of policies and the importance of legal aspects as well. Because when we look at this from a macroscopic lens, there are the marginalized individuals who are highly affected. If other immediate legal based interventions and policy based developments that can be implemented in be it urban planning or agriculture sectors in order to, you know, address the fossil fuel consumption and the greenhouse gas emissions. And that is one thing that we have in mind. And of non-compliance what are the notable success stories that these challenges can kind of you know be addressed so to discuss about these set of ideas i'll ask Anishi to share her thoughts uh, thank you so much so i will be talking uh, i will be answering this question more in the lines of the indian context and the indian policy framework so uh, the fourth system accounts for more than one third of the total greenhouse gases as we know and they not only contribute to and are significantly affected by climate change, but are also a crucial part of the solutions urgently needed to keep the global warming level at a 1.5 degree uh, mark that we had set up for ourselves. Now, from a purely policy based perspective, there's an urgent need to review existing electricity subsidies uh, for biogas production that unintentionally incentivize the growth of industrial livestock industry as well as the tax credit subsidies and loans to increase production of biofuel uh, feedstocks such as soy and corn. Now, coming to the Indian side of things, the Indian Council of Agricultural Research or the ICAR, a bloc uh, under the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmer Welfare, uh, have launched a flagship network program called the National Innovations of Climate Resilient Agriculture. Now, this project categorically, project or policy, whatever you may call it, categorically aims to develop and promote a climate resilient technologies in agriculture to address vulnerable areas of the country to help uh, the districts and the regions prone to extreme weather conditions like droughts, floods, frost, or heat waves in this case to cope up with such extremes. Now, this would mean investing in both short term and long term research programs uh, with uh, the national perspective having been take up involving uh, adaptation and mitigation 
uh, covering crops, horticulture, livestock, fisheries, poultry, etc. Now, the main thrust areas uh, covered in the same are firstly identifying the most vulnerable district regions. Secondly, involving uh, the crop varieties and management practices for adaptation and mitigation. And lastly, also assessing the climate change impact on livestock, fisheries and poultry, and also identifying the uh, respective adaptation strategies for the same. Now, the NIRCA project has developed several resilient technologies to mitigate the climate change, mitigate climate change. So, for instance, adopting climate resilient technologies, such as creating uh, resilient varieties of different crops that are tolerant to climate stresses, and also uh, uh, a process called the zero till drilling, uh, drill sowing of wheat to escape terminal heat stress. Also, other alternate methods of rice cultivation, as we know, rice involves a lot of water wastage, a uh, lot of water consumption. I wouldn't say wastage, but so ICAR is also recommending a soil test balance based on integrated nutrient management practice and uh, through the uh, through the conjunctive use of both inorganic and organic sources, uh, one can uh, uh, help uh, expand such sustainable methods. Now. However, despite all these policies being in place, if you look at the real life implementation of these policies, the reality is this less than 4% of Indian farmers have adopted sustainable uh, agricultural practices uh, and systems, according to a study conducted by the Council of Energy uh, and Environment and Water, Center of Energy and Environment and Water. Now, the reason for this is twofold. Firstly, the existence of multiple sustainable oriented practices and the actual budget allocation within the Ministry of Agriculture itself constitutes a meager 0.8% of the budget allocated to the ministry itself. This clearly implies an obvious rift between the policy making and actual practical and legal implementation of the same. Now, the second reason is the simple fact that farmers uh, don't want to quite go the sustainable route to begin with. For them, it is much easier to simply uh, burn crops after the harvest season rather than employ other methods. Now, the reason for the same is the fact that at the end of the day, sustainable farming isn't quite uh, synonymous with profit making. Farmers would incur huge fixed costs to create the infrastructure required to implement the same. And in return, they have no security for their future. Example I would like to give is the EU farmer protest that happened a very similar uh, line of reasoning followed that uh, there were very strict policy implementations that the EU nations had put upon uh, their farmers uh, to impose uh, more sustainable farming. However, while doing so, they did not ensure the profit-making capability of the same. Uh, hence, it caused wide outrage across all EU nation farmers. Now, it is important thus to adopt a more balanced approach to things. For now, it is important, I believe, to set as a nation to set our priorities. As we see, even we don't even have uh, uh, as such a uh, as such the finances to support uh, this mission. Sustainability uh, is for sustainability to be truly effective. One needs to have a unified perspective towards the same. As a nation, India currently does not have that, unfortunately. Moving on to urban planning. Uh, India is, isn't quite famous for the best urban planning. When it comes to something such as garbage disposal, most waste in India is either uh, incinerated, which, which, which would in turn uh, release greenhouse emissions in the atmosphere, or they would either be dumped in landfills causing soil and water pollution. When it comes to electricity, again, most electricity generated in India employs the use of fossil fuels. Windmills or hydroelectric turbines both require fossil fuel to function. Now, even if one looks at the overall distribution of population, the same is more concentrated towards the bigger cities, leading to imposing of untoward pressure on overall sustainability. Quite simply put, it is quite difficult to maintain environmental sustainability in an area which, say, is only designed to accommodate, say, a thousand people, but in reality, there are almost 10,000 people living there. So to combat this, of course, uh, over the course of years, there have been multiple uh, policy frameworks that have been implemented, uh, some more successful than the other. Uh, the first one I would like to point out is the Swachh Bharat mission that took place. Uh, 
in accelerating change for safe sanitation, waste management, and focus on door-to-door -door collection and segregation of waste processing. Uh, the second one I could point out is uh, the Smart C Cities mission. Uh, it aims at promoting cities that provide core infrastructure, clean and sustainable environment, and uh, giving a decent quality of life to their citizens through application of smart solutions. The focus is on sustainable and inclusive development by creating a replicable model, uh, which act as lighthouses to other aspiring cities, essentially lifting off some of the weight from uh, the metropolitan cities. Uh, Another government initiative uh, I would like to point out would be the solar power mission, wherein the government has employed huge quantities of solar panels uh, as means of renewable sources of energy, essentially providing electricity in rural areas. Uh, expanding the scheme further would not only mean lesser dependence on fossil fuels, but also significantly slowing down climate change. Now, all in all, these policies have been successful and unsuccessful in their own ways. But one thing is clear, when one talks about something such as heat waves, it is crucial for one to not assess these things in isolation. The overall warming of the climate is a clear indication uh, of the years of compounding and unsustainable methods of pollution uh, that are present in all sectors of the society. Uh, yes, agriculture and urban planning are two bigger sectors, but uh, it expands nevertheless to every single sector there is. And if one wants to truly solve this, it is important to look at things more practically. The sol solar power example that I gave is a perfect example for the same. The reason why it has so many billions of dollars in investment currently uh, is because of its profit-making capability. Sustainability is certainly a need of the hour, and thus it becomes extremely crucial for governments to take this task up, not by just mere legal intervention. Yes, it is a starting point for the same, but also establish a mechanism to incentivize it. So that will be my take. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanishi. You have actually encapsulated a very comprehensive idea about how you know policymakers and scientists can also come in to both microscopic and macroscopic level, especially in Indian landscape, and that was truly pretty much insightful. Thanks a lot for all the ideas that you've mentioned. So before coming to a conclusion, do you do we have any other ideas or thoughts that we can put in in general? I would just like to mention how climate financing can also play a pivotal role in order to mitigate you know, the unprecedented rise in temperature at global level. But however, this also, uh, you know, kind of acts between the developed countries and developing countries at large. And this is also one of the mitigation strategies that can be developed by encapsulating all of these uh, points that you've discussed when we're talking about migration, agriculture, energy efficiency, and sustainable development. But nevertheless, thank you all for your uh, um, insightful thoughts and ideas that you've shared. All have been pretty much meaningful. With that, let's come to a conclusion of this roundtable discussion. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.